All right. Mel Zabecki is the Arkansas State Archaeologist. She rece received her BA in Anthropology from Mount Holyoke College in Western Massachusetts and her MA and PhD from the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. She began her career as an ancient Egypt bioarchaeologist working at various cemeteries around Egypt, learning about past life ways while adjunct instructing. Wow, Mel. <laughs> Um, at a few different universities. Then she became a park interpreter for Arkansas State Parks, where she not only became well-versed in educating the public, but learned about American archaeology. Mel joined the Arkansas Archaeological Survey as their education outreach coordinator and then moved into the state archaeologist, archaeologist position. As state archaeologist, Mel collaborates with the Arkansas Archaeological Survey Station archaeologists, multiple federal and state agencies, as well as private citizens to help spread awareness of the rich history of Arkansas and the importance of protecting archaeological sites from destruction. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'd forgotten I'd written that uh, that intro. So some of my my stuff that I was going to talk about on my intro slide is has already been said. So that's a good thing. Um, so yeah, hi y'all. I'm so glad that y'all joined us today um, for the Shiloh um, series. Uh, Kim Hosey at the Shiloh had asked me to do this last year, uh, and I I agreed, and then um, you know promptly forgot about it, of course. But uh, I think she asked me to do it back then because uh, I was writing a, a little like native plants column in our. Um, our local uh, Washington County Master Gardener newsletter. And what I had been doing was I was trying to, uh, you know, think up native plants each month, to talk about that had been found in the archaeology uh, of Arkansas and that, that in informed us about uh, past life ways and stuff. So I was kind of like doing this little, like just a little cheesy, like, you know, once a month, little short column um, that was, you know, talked about a lot of plants that I was familiar with. So I'm here today to give you um, a talk about some of my favorite native plants. And what I'm going to do is I'm only going to give you five of my favorite plants that I'm going to talk about because I've been to talks before uh, where someone will talk about you know, their favorite roses. And then like a half an hour later, they're on rose number 175 of the species and you can't, you're just like lost. So I'm just hoping that this will be, uh, at the end, I'll give you some resources. And I hope that this will just be sort of an inspiration for you to uh, kind of go out and, and start identifying your native plants and then going back and figuring out uh, their uses and how you could use them and how people have used them in the past. And it's just kind of a fun hobby that I have um, that, um, you know, that, hope you know, obviously you guys are interested in plants. So uh, hopefully that'll inspire you a little bit, but if you came here to, you know, learn very specifically about a lot of different ones, um, you know, we can maybe, I can answer some other questions at the end. Uh, a little disclaimer, the background and my, my uh, picture that I sent in as the, for the advertisement focuses on, uh, or uh, features corn. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to mislead you, but I'm not going to talk about corn at all today because I realize it's not a native plant. Um, so uh, I use this as my background all the time just because it's so pretty. It's glass gem popcorn that I grew years ago. Um, and, you know, I just I love corn and I can give a whole other talk about corn. And if we have time at the end, I'll talk about corn, uh, but not a native plant anyway. And you don't normally just like see it growing like wild in the landscape. So a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about today is actually are actually wild plants. Uh, so anyway little disclaimer there. So yeah, I'm at the Arkansas Archaeological Survey. I'm the state archaeologist. Uh, the survey is a division of the University of Arkansas. So uh, we have our coordinating office in Fayetteville, but we have 10 stations scattered around the state that have um, archaeologists that cover that, ter you know, different territories in the state. Um, so we not only study sites, but we protect and manage um, or learn about protecting and managing them. And then we share what we learn uh, with the public, which is what I'm doing here today. So you came for a native plants talk, but I'm gonna incorporate a lot of archeology span into it because, well, um, I'm doing this at work, so I better talk about archeology span while I'm talking about plants, right? So, uh, but you know, a lot of my, the background that I know about plants comes from our archeological knowledge. So let me go to the next slide, see if I can actually advance and make this thing work. Okay, so I told you we're gonna talk about plants, but we're gonna talk first about paleoethnobotany. And I know that's a big word. Some of you that are master gardeners joining in have heard me use this or seen me use this word a lot. Um, but basically paleoethnobotany is 
um, a, a, an arm or a, a branch of archaeology that studies the ancient human use of plants. Um, paleo being old, ethno being cultural, of course, botany having to do with plants. And this is the reason that we have paleoethnobotany is because we don't have cookbooks, we don't have um, uh, uh, blueprints, we don't have user manuals from the past. Okay, so we have to um, use the actual plant remains to understand what people were using in the past. And the way that we do it is not by just digging up plants, right? Because plants don't really survive in the soil. Um, they're organic and they normally rot away. So what we're looking for actually, um, unless it's like a bluff shelter where the plants have been dried and really well preserved, um, usually we're just digging out of the ground soil that contains charred seeds and charred nutshell remains. And you can't, we don't just find piles of that stuff, right? So we have to separate that out from the soil. And we do that in a process called flotation. So the slide that I have here um, on the left-hand side is sort of a diagram of um, a typical float tank um, where basically there's agitated water. You're throwing a soil sample in on top of a screen. Um, all the goo, like the sludge and the, the, the soil and the, the clay and all the junk that we don't want floats to the bottom. Um, but the agitation on this in the, uh, in the sort of middle section of the tank um, actually floats uh, any organic and seed remains up and over and we catch it in a sleeve or a mesh screen which you see in the little picture with the gross um, uh, dirty water and then we dry those things in this in the um, you know in these little tiny screens and then a person uh, sits around for hours and hours and sorts out the little teeny tiny somehow pebbles that made it through from the seeds and then the seeds come out um, as these little tiny black charred things. And that's why we need paleoethnobotanists to study this stuff because they actually can see, um, they, they can uh, identify seeds and, and also seed fragments, which is even more fun because if you just get a fragment of something, it's really hard to tell. Uh, but um, I tell you what, go home and, and, and look at a poppy seed if you have a microscope or a magnifying glass and a poppy seed, you know, you'll just be blown away at the, at the size um, of the little teeny, tiny, tiny, tiny things, the facets on a, on a seed that you don't even used to seeing with your naked eye. So um, not that, but Anyway, poppy seeds are a long story. I can tell you about that later. But, um, you know, any of these seeds have their own um, distinctive shapes. And so the paleoethnobotanist can actually identify these things. So they go through the soil and it's a painstaking process, but it gets us to the heart of the matter of what were people using in the past. All right, I'm going to stop with that. Just understand that that's how we learn about um, uh, plants that were used in the past. Um, aside from the stuff that comes out of bluff shelters, we find things in, in the form of seeds and shells. All right, so my favorite five plants. I love persimmons and I love pawpaws and it's because they're delicious. I love rattlesnake master because it's got the best name of any plant I've ever heard. I love elderberry because it's so um, uh, prolific and it's used in so many different ways um, and it's very um, uh, noticeable on the landscape. And then finally, I know that acorns aren't plants, but oak trees are the plants that they come off of. And my favorite part of the oak tree is the acorn. And also another um, thing that is quite prolific, um, but also um, they're really, they're a good challenge. I like good challenges. And those things took me uh, a long time to figure out how to use them and what to do with them and how to process them to make them edible. So uh, the first two and the last two are essentially like edibles. Um, they're, they're edible things, but the middle one, Rattlesnake Master, I'll, you know, I'm going to go through each one of these, obviously, um, in, in exhaustive uh, um, uh, description. So uh, the, the middle one is not edible. Uh, although the roots I hear are edible. So let's, let's go into each one of them. Let me give you the backstory. Um, as, as my introduction said, I worked at Park and Archaeological State Park as a park interpreter. And when I got there, um, I was charged with continuing programs that had been going on for years. And one of them was the native feast uh, that happened every November. So I started growing things uh, so that I could have foods that I could process for this native feast that we had. And so um, at first I did the cliche corn, beans, and squash. And and um, but as I started reading through the archaeological literature, because it is park and archaeological state park, after all, uh, I found that there were a lot of a lot of other plants, of course, being used during this uh, Mississippi time period. And um, that came originally from um, plants that were domesticated in the woodland period before that. So I got interested in like learning a lot more about lots of different kinds of plants and also 
about plants that were not domesticated. Um, and and I started collecting food in the wild. And so um, I, I learned just a ton about uh, both grown and gathered foods um, that I wound up incorporating into my native feast. But then uh, I got a little bit further into the literature and, and reading about this stuff and learning about native dyes, uh, natural plant dyes, as well as medicinal. Now the medicinal part is hard because like basically you can use any plant for anything if you combine it with something else and plus you can poison yourself to death. So I don't go too deep into that part because I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not, I'm not I don't mess too much with that stuff, but I'm kind of familiar with a little bit of how you, how you use these things. So as a park interpreter, I got to play around and learn all this stuff. Um, and, and I, I continue to to do a little bit. Um, as state archaeologist, I don't get to do too much programming anymore, but even as my previous job as education coordinator here at the survey, I was able to um, promote this gathering gardening agriculture uh, fifth grade curriculum that can be used in other uh, grades as well. Uh, but it talks about the the sort of the use. It's a, it's a paleoethnobotanical curriculum uh, based in a social studies curriculum in Arkansas. And so um, just take a look at that if you're a teacher or if you know if you're homeschooler or anything, you can use this curriculum to learn, teach the kids about plants and usage all the way from the beginning of a human settlement in Arkansas 15,000 years ago, all the way up until the contact period so um you know different kinds of activities and stuff it's pretty cool but you know we we um basically can not just identify plants but actually understand how domestication happened and so this curriculum kind of goes through that process which is a lot of fun now one more thing before i give you my you know start with the plants is um you know I, there are there were a lot of other people in Arkansas besides pre-contact um, American Indians. But when I learned about plants, I, I did it in this context in learning about um, pre-contact folks that, that were here and, and uh, you know, settled the land and, and used and utilized the land for, you know, 15,000, 17,000 years. And so, you know, of course, the first thing you think about when you think of a plant is, you know, they relied on plants for food and whether they be the gathered foods like greens or grains, uh, seeds, um, nuts or, or fruits that were native to this uh, to this region, or um, eventually uh, agriculture took hold at about 900, eh, a little bit before 900. There was horticulture, then there was large scale agriculture um, about a thousand years ago when the when the horticulture started, um, and 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 foods were eventually domesticated. And you know, of course, the one you think of is the three sisters: sunbean, uh, uh, corn, beans, and squash. But there were other things too that were grown and eventually um, domesticated or or brought in domesticated. Um, you know, and of course the corn and stuff like that, not, not necessarily that native. Uh, but anyway, a lot of these grown foods and gathered foods, you have to think about storage. So uh, when you're thinking about plants for food, you have to think about things that are going to store well. So that's why cucumbers just never made it big time. Um, you know, there are, there are things that you want to uh, focus more on uh, that, that are things that will store well for you, um, get preserved through the winters and the, and the hungry months. Uh, but also plants are used for tools. So think about all the, the wood and the um, hard parts of plants um, that could be used for lots of different kinds of tools and, and other things with living. And then plants were also used for textiles um, and clothing. Um, no cotton, okay? So there wasn't any cotton. So you gotta think of other plants that were, and no flax or linen or anything like that. There were other things though uh, that were made into textiles as and, and also like, cordage and rope and things like that. So any kind of textile, not necessarily just clothing. Um, I'll show you a picture of a sandal later on that uh, was used, made out of plants. And then of course, you know, there's the artistic part of textiles and, and uh, woven basketry that have to do with dyeing things. Um, so plants for dye. And then also, like I mentioned, plants for medicine. So plants were incredibly, you know, before modern technology allowed us to um, manipulate metal, mine and manipulate metal. And before we were able to make glass or plastic, plants were everything. Okay, maybe there were rocks. Too. Rocks were important too, but plants did all these things, whereas rocks just made tools for you, right? But And maybe fire if you were good enough. Plants, in, incredibly you can't you can't live with that and you can't live without them now but we we sort of do other stuff to kind of get around that um but basically plants you know they're they were used for everything um things that we have nowadays you know used to be made out of plants and now they're made out of other things but couldn't couldn't survive without all these things um you know i focus on them a lot for food but we have to always remember that they were used for all of these other things all right let's go with the list number one persimmons 
Diasporus Virginiana, maybe, or Diasporus Virgin, who knows? These, these words um, are the genus and species names. They're called the Latin names or the uh, binomial name, um, the scientific name. So uh, the genus is the first word, um, you always capitalize. The species is the second word. And then sometimes if you're looking at plant packets or you're reading about stuff, there might be like another word after it. Um, that's, the, that's either subspecies or uh, a designation to say who named it first. So, um, but basically um, the persimmon. The persimmon is uh, usually grows to a very, very large tree. The bark is pretty uh, distinctive. Uh, you can sometimes mix it up with dogwood because of that weird um, sort of bark pattern. But it, if you really look, when you get used to it, you'll, you'll be able to tell the difference. Um, and of course, persimmons get a lot larger than dogwoods. Um, this picture <laughs> of my sad little persimmon, I put here because it's very indicative of, of a very important um, aspect of the persimmon in that it has to be fall in order for these things to be eaten. Now, I hear a lot of people say that, you know, you can't eat them until the first frost. I have not found that to be true, but it definitely has to be at the very, very late fall period. Um, you know, November. So I know that we usually get a frost by November, but even if it hasn't, I've perf I found perfectly viable persimmons to eat. Uh, but, you know, they look really pathetic on the trees um, because the leaves are gone uh, by that time. And then uh, the leaves, I mean, the, uh, the limbs are usually too far away to be picking these things off anyway. So you have to wait till they hit the ground. Um, and so uh, persimmons, uh, are, are a scary fruit. Um, some people have PTSD from their trickster siblings making them eat a persimmon when it wasn't ripe, when they were younger and they've never forgotten the sensation of feeling like your mouth has been completely filled with very dry cotton. It is miserable to eat an unripe persimmon. And so uh, if, if you find them on the ground, you have to make sure that they are beyond this stage. If you find them in the supermarket, they're, they're ones that are domesticated and grown in California and Asia and stuff. So those are fine. But if you are in the wild and trying to eat a persimmon, do not, don't even eat ones that look like this. They look right, but they're not. You want them to look like this. They gotta be ugly as all get out and nasty, nasty, nasty looking. And the way that you can figure, I mean, they look rotten, but I promise you nothing in that pumpkin bowl is rotten. The way that I do it is I go out there and I, I, I bend over and I smell every single one of them. And you could smell if it's rotten or not. If it's rotten, you throw it as far away as you can get it so that you don't pick it up again. And then you walk around and you pick up these nasty things. And that, my friends, tastes like the sweetest candy you will ever, ever have. And now if you don't want to deal with, and then, you know, those little crinkly things on top or the, I don't know what you call them, but you don't want to eat those, but I just put them in there for looks. Um, but basically, um, um, if you don't want to deal with like the grossness of the gross factor of having this nasty, you know, looking thing um, and, and the large seeds that are on the inside, you can put it through um, some kind of a sieve and make a pulp out of it. Okay, so I try on the left hand side of that picture, I tried a ricer at one point that failed. Um, but what I found works best is this, um, this cone. Uh, I call it a hippie cone because I can't remember what it's called normally, but it's a, a metal sieve that you kind of push the push everything through the, the uh, seeds and the skin wind up on the inside and the pulp drops down. Then you can collect it, you can add it to breads, you can make um, cakes. But then also you can dry it out on a dehydrator. If you have mats on your dehydrator racks, you can just spread it out and make fruit leather out of it. Um, and it's, it's, it's the most delicious thing in the whole wide world. You don't have to add anything to it. You just spread it on there and dry it. Now, um, in the past, uh, these things shown, uh, persimmon showed up even in the DeSoto Chronicles when the Spanish uh, came through here that the Native Americans were drying these things out, either like prunes, um, but then you still get a lot of seeds. So what they were probably also doing was pulping it just like this and drying it out somehow in the sun and having it um, as a keeper to add to things later. Um, you can add it to stews and it'll sweeten and thicken it and stuff like that. 
archaeologically, we find the seeds of these things. Okay. So they're the seeds, you know, I don't have, a, I don't know why I don't have a picture of persimmon seeds. They're so plentiful. Um, but that's how we find them. And usually of course, in the charred fashion so that they haven't rotten away, but they're pretty stout seeds anyway. So I think we would find them even if they weren't burnt. Um, persimmon, uh, pulp is of course, you know, it's a fruit. So it's high in, I think vitamins A and C. Um, and then there's also like, of course, minerals and all kinds of good stuff with it. Um, just like any other fruit, basically it's a healthy thing. Uh, there is a champion persimmon. Uh, I don't know if you all know about the champion trees program, but, uh, there, there are, is a look it up it's great the champion trees um, are marked in different places in arkansas when they're on pro, uh, public property and the champion persimmon of arkansas is on the uh south side of wilson park and i know it looks real long and spindly but that's it and um there's a there's a marker if you're confused about which one it is just look around and there's a marker uh that's sh a big stone marker just to the right of the trunk in that picture that shows which tree it is you know that that it's the champion and so, uh, you know, you can go visit, visit that and see the champion persimmon. You can see how big these things get. When they're not surrounded by other trees, the spread gets real big too. Um, the wood of it uh, was most likely used, you know, um, uh, for like handles and things like that. Although we don't necessarily always break down wood to figure out what species it is when we find stuff in the archeology. span uh, But nowadays the wood is still prized. Um, I read that it was supposed to be, they're used for like wooden golf club heads and uh, um, shuttles for uh, weaving, you know, shuttles, the little wooden shuttle things that go when people weave. Uh, and um, so, you know, and, and veneer like for, for different furniture and stuff like that. So it's still a prized um, wood. Uh, like I said, this one's at Wilson Park. Uh, there, there are a few on the Razorback Greenway that I watch every year and pick stuff up when it drops. There used to be some at uh, Lake Fayetteville. And when they fixed the boat docks down there, they, I'm pretty sure they cut those things down, but I collected off of those trees for a few years. Um, and when you find one, you'll, you'll remember where it is and then you'll go back the next fall and look for them. So um, they're really delicious and amazing and, and native and have been used for um, you know thousands of years basically. So they're fantastic and I love them and they're delicious. Again, uh, I see someone, uh, Pam said 65 years later, I still won't eat persimmons thanks to my grandfather. So yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, rough thing to have an unripe one. Number two. A simina triloba, the elusive papa. Um, I, these things, you know, I said I like acorns for the challenge. I think the same thing goes uh, for the papa. These things are just a pain in the neck. So here's the deal. Um, this is a grove of papa. Ignore the, the big thick thing that's coming from the right side of the screen and down to the middle. I think that's probably a stupid grapevine. Um, but the, the pawpaws are, are often found in groves um, and they're usually not very significant looking trees. Uh, they grow in the understory, okay? And uh, I often, when I started to tr really try to figure them out, uh, to identify them and find them, I kept mixing them up with hickory trees because they have those wide leaves. However, hickory trees get a lot bigger. They turn into big trees and these things pretty, I mean, I've seen some uh, pawpaw that might end up being like six inches in diameter for their trunk, but not much bigger. I'm sure there are bigger ones, but usually they're found, like I said, understory, little spindly things here. In the fall, those leaves turn brilliant yellow and they're just gorgeous. And like I said, they occur in groves. So they're usually like you know, it's pretty, pretty cool to see them all. This picture I took at Mount Nebo State Park um, down in, the, in central Arkansas. And um, the park interpreter there had alerted me, we have a big pawpaw grove. So we went there, my friend Emily, another archaeologist, Emily Beam in the picture and I went there and traipsed through, you know, this big, huge grove looking for pawpaws right at the time when they were supposed to be uh, in fruit. And um, wouldn't you know it, I think we came out with like four four stinking pawpaws. And I started reading this book um, about them and trying to figure out what the deal was. And it turns out there's two problems with pawpaws. They're stingy with their fruit. And they're stingy with their fruit because number one, well, one is stingy, one is just a, a malfunction. They're stingy because they actually, the trees themselves actually reproduce by sending suckers out. 
Um, and so they don't need to put a lot of energy into making fruit because they can reproduce under the ground and send the suckers out. In that process, so, you know, who cares about making fruit if I've got roots that make new trees, right? But then in the process, they create entire groves of clones, okay? So all these things are a clone of themselves. So when they do wind up flowering, they're just cross-pollinating with the same genetics and they can't make new. So they, they, they don't wind up making a lot of fruit because they don't, they don't cross-pollinate is what I meant to say, um, because there's not a lot of genetic diversity within one grove. So they have to travel from afar. Um, and, and so getting a, getting a pawpaw is going, pawpaw hunting is equivalent to snipe hunting, basically. It's just, it's just, it's like a constant, dramatic, sad event. But when you do get a pawpaw, it is the most phantasmagorical experience because they're weird. They're just weird. They're custardy. They're, they're like these, these like wet mango banana crosses and they're delicious. They also have giant seeds. Uh, they come in lots of different sizes as you can see me holding them. But again, they're persnickety. Once you get one, if it's not uh, ripe, you can't ripen them on the counter in a bag or anything. I've tried, I've tried everything. So you have to literally wait for the very perfect day that the deer doesn't get to the pawpaw first when it hits the ground. So they're hard, they're just hard to get, but when you get them, they're amazing. Um, I have tried to propagate these things with major failure. Uh, I collect the seeds one year and I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna plant them next year. And then I read that you can't dry the seeds out. So then you have to put them in the fridge and you have to um, stratify them in the refrigerator so that they can go through a cold cycle. Then you can plant them. Well, you know, back of the fridge, I forget. And then like, I find them two years later and they're all like moldy. So I have to throw them out. So anyway, I've got three in the garage right now that have been growing for three years now. And now I don't have a place to put them. So I, you know, it's just like one heartbreak after another trying to make these things. I'm in the middle of this book right now. It's fantastic. Um, as far as archaeologically, uh, you wouldn't expect to see a bag, but it turns out that um, you, you see the brown things, those are called wet, the little skinny brown threads, those are called wefts. If you ever want to learn about weaving, the warps go up and down and the wefts go white to weft. That's how I remember it. And if you stand the bag up, the warps are going white to weft. Um, and so uh, the, uh, the, the thing that holds this whole bag together are the warp or the wefts. And uh, that is made out of, uh, out of um, pawpaw fiber. And, and I have not, uh, personally processed pawpaw fiber, but I know somebody that has, and it's a nasty process because you have to do something called redding the fiber where you basically, you strip the, and it's also destructive. So I don't want to go doing this to too many trees when I don't have it. Now at Mount Nebo, there's a grove. I might be able to collect from there if I get permission. Anyway, you got to like strip the fiber off the bark or like the inner bark kind of fiber stuff. And then you got to like throw it in water and let it rot for like a month. And then you pull it out and then you process the fiber. It, it doesn't sound particularly fun to me. So, uh, but anyway, this is the Eden Bluff seed bag found in, I think Newton County. I'm sorry, I'm a state archeologist and I can't remember this thing right now, but off the top of my head, it's from a bluff shelter. Um, uh, and uh, it was, it's filled with seeds. It's filled with um, goosefoot seeds. It's, it's this amazing, thing that's in our museum and that only gets gets to come out once in a while because it's so rare uh but anyway wefts pawpaw fiber um uh rattlesnake master number three again the rad name it's so great and, and it's even got a great great latin name eryngium yuccifolium it is not a yucca it looks like a yucca um but if you look real close, not necessarily in any picture but if you're looking for things if you're trying to identify it you know before the flowers things come out uh you know you can mistake it for like a grass basically and the way that you know it's rattlesnake master is because on the edges on the margin of the leaves there's these little sticky things that um are pointy like almost like fibers not quite thorns sticking out of the the, the leaves so um that's how you can identify it and then when you get the buttons come out the flowers come out then you it's unmistakable unmistakable totally like almost unique on the landscape, really weird plant. And um, 
I, I have these grown on my front lawn and, because I just love this stuff so much. And look at the pollinators on this thing. Like there's every kind of pollinator you can imagine. If you just keep looking, you're just gonna see something different. I think I counted like 12 different kinds of pollinators on these things. They don't smell, well, for humans, they don't, obviously they smell to bugs cause they can find them. But, and they're really like um, pointy, like they're not pleasant to touch that you don't wanna go smelling them and get it up your nose. Uh, but that's the flower. I don't really understand it, but it's really cool. And they're really, you know, just, again, I just stand there for hours staring at these pollinators all over the place. They're not very pretty once they go to seed, um, but you know, the seeds, that's how they reproduce. So I always break them up and I get a glove and I, I take it and break them up all over the soil and they reproduce year after year. Now, why, why, you know, why is this in an archeology span talk? Because uh, it made cordage. So uh, the, uh, the leaves were nice and long. And they had these long, long, long fibers in them that could be spliced together once everything. So the way, by the way, you don't just take a green leaf and like make cordage out of it, right? You got to process it just like you have to process the pawpaw fiber. Um, and the way that you do it, I think, is like you basically take a rock or a scraper and you like scrape the snot out of the, out of the leaf, all the green stuff, and you get the fibers left over. But then you have to like dry them and process them and make them strong and stuff. So there's a whole process I don't really know anything about, but um, anyway, they made sandals out of these things. And I know this doesn't look like a sandal, but trust me, it is. Um, lots of sandals found in bluff shelters around Arkansas and Missouri um, that are thousands of years old. And they're so well-preserved that archeologists and uh, Native Americans have been able to work together to figure out how to make these things again. So I know how to make sandals, um, not the actual thread that makes the sandals, but I can get yarn and I can actually make these. I have one somewhere in the office, but I don't feel like going digging it out, um, but it's fun, it's cool. And it was a very, very important cordage plant. Um, one of the most important ones, the, the pawpaw again is another one and there's dog bane as well, but fiber plants are extremely important because there were very few of them. Remember no cotton, no flax. So, uh, these things, um, were all of the, the fiber uh, the uh, textiles and cordage and stuff like that. Um, and also, uh, that bag again, the actual warps, the, all the brown, you know, the lighter brown stuff is actually made out of rattlesnake master fiber. Um, archaeologically, this is how we find it. We don't find the seeds or anything like that. They, they don't end up burned, right? Because they don't end up as meals. So think about how these things get processed. Like they're not by the food stuff. So they don't get burned in, a, in, a, in the hearth and the fire. So we don't get seeds or anything like that of Rattlesnake Master, but we get the textiles and the bluff shelters. So that's a fun one. Number four, Sambucus canadensis is elderberry. And, um, you know, everybody's heard of elderberry. I used to use elderberry under eye gel from the body shop when I was in high school. So I knew elder, you know, and, and old timer, I shouldn't say old timers, people uh, use elderberry, you know, they collect elderberries and make tinctures and syrups to um, boost their immune systems in the winter for colds and stuff like that. So I think elderberries are still part of our culture. Um, but you know, it's, it's maybe something that we pass by in the landscape a lot that we, um, sort of sometimes don't notice, but elderberry, um, is, uh, extremely prolific in open, uh, spaces that have been, um, uh, disrupted. I don't know why I can't think of the word, but anyway, it's like a uh, soil that's not, it's, I see it like along like railroad beds and stuff and, uh, stuff that's been turned over a lot. So you'll see it in large packs, um, on the left is the flower. Some you, if you don't, if you're not used to looking at it, you can mistake it with, well, very early on, you would mistake it with Queen Anne's lace because the, you know, just because the flower cluster like that. Um, and then later on, a lot of people mix it up with um, one, some of the hemlocks, either the water or the poison hemlocks because of the flower. Um, but then as you get used to your landscape and know what plants are what and know where plants are, You'll remember where your elderberry is because it'll turn into berries after, you know, uh, later summer, you get these crazy berries um, that turn basically black and um, they're not good to eat. You don't want to eat them raw because they're not, they're sort of, they can be toxic, but also they, they just, they're terrible tasting. I've dried them because we find seeds in the archaeology. So we know we were eating, they were eating them, but this they're nasty and I've dried them and they just like almost disappear. You know, like a grape will turn into a raisin when you, dry, these things like they're, 
pathetic. Like I'll, you know, put an entire tray, you know, from the dehydrator and then it'll make like a teaspoon of, of stupid dried things. So not incredibly worth your time. However, they do make a beautiful dye. Now I want to say something about dye. Don't just go out and crush a bunch of berries and expect your cotton to be dyed. It doesn't, it doesn't stay on the fabric. You got to do something called mordanting to begin with, and then you got to fix it at the end. It's not easy, and I'm no way an expert. I've failed in most of my dyeing experiments, but it is fun to see the direct, you know, immediate effects of the elderberry because it comes out nicer than almost anything, um, anything else on the landscape. So, what you know, if you eventually, although it does stay on the, the basket fibers, you see on the bottom picture, I have it's just a bunch of basket um, uh, stays or whatever you call the basket fibers, uh, wood peelings, what, I can't think of the words, but anyway, uh, it stays on that stuff. But like, if you're trying to do fabric, it it's, a, there's a lot more to it. Okay. Um, and so, um, otherwise they probably, you know, they were using it as a dye and they are in the, in the past, um, probably eating it. Um, but nowadays people, again, you know, break it down and use it as syrups and things like that. And, you know, jellies and wine and all that other stuff, but it, it's the sugar makes everything edible. This, this elderberry itself, it's terrible, terrible tasting, uh, generally, but a very important plant, um, a, you know, gives you different, um, antioxidants and things like that. So people do use it still. Um, and you know, the potty shop elderberry under eye gel. So it makes me stay so young. All right. Lastly, acorns again, it's the oak tree really. So Quercus is the oak uh, genus. And then there's, you know, a ton of speed. There's 40 kinds of oaks just in Arkansas. There's like 400 oaks total. Um, there's so many oaks. Like whenever I see a tree, I'm like, oak, you know, I'm just like, whatever. It's probably an oak. Um, the thing is, is that there's two main families of oaks. There's red and white. Now there is a white oak, but then there's other trees in the white oak family. My favorite white oak is the burr oak. And I'll show you a picture of it in a second. But the red oaks, you know, have all the, uh, there's a red oak as well, but then there's also red oaks like sawtooth oak. And, you know, there's other ones that are in that red oak family. Uh, the acorns come off of these things. Some are big and some are small. Um, the burr oak is on the left. I don't remember on the right, uh, jack, black pin oak. I can't remember what's on the right, but anyway, left is the, um, the burr oak and it's giant. It's hilariously giant. Um, and it's the reason I think I like it, not because of the taste, but because it's just so big, it's easy to process. And it is from the white oak family. So it takes a little bit less processing. They all have tannic acid. So you can't eat any acorns raw. Um, you, you have to process them. And again, I found it less of a harrowing process to deal with the white family, um, than it is. Uh, for, you know, so, it, it, but again, if, if you have time, you can do either one. So here's how you process acorns. And I know I say acorns funny, by the way, because I'm originally from New Jersey and I get laughed at all the time. Uh, you crack them with your ancient nutcracker hammer, and then you put them in your ninja blender and uh, blend it up with water. Okay. And then you make a lot of space in your refrigerator and you pay a little extra on your water bill that month because what you're going to do is you're going to put it in water and you're going to leach those tannins out. And every day you're going to pour the water off and put new water in and shake it up and pour the water off and pour, you know, and basically it'll go from dark brown water, tannic acid is what people use, used to use to tan hides. So it is a useful byproduct, but it's, poisonous essentially to us not to squirrels not to deer they can eat pigs they can eat all that stuff but we can't process the acid out so we have to do it with water so you break it up with water you break it up put it in water 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 i have tried boiling don't boil it it turns into gummy nastiness so a lot of people say oh just boil it out it'll go faster no just be patient put the water 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 and the reason the water's white on the um on the right hand side is because i've just shooken it up so if you see the other two pictures on the left, there's like a layer on the very, very bottom. That's like, I think, fat from the nut meat. Um, eventually that settles to the bottom. I had just shook in that one to go through a final leaching phase. Um, but then the water comes out clear and that's when you know you're ready to get the meat out. You drain it, you dry it, 
I use a dehydrator because I use a dehydrator for everything in my life. Um, and then you can either use it in that way as a gruel. You can, you know, cook it in water and make a gruel out of it, or you can put it through another grinding with something else, coffee grinder, whatever, if you have a flour mill and uh, make it into flour. How's it taste? It tastes like dirt, um, but it's nutritious. It's survivor food. Some folks are thinking about what happens when, when society collapses, we're gonna eat acorns and we're gonna eat bugs. Um, and so it's fun to learn how to process foods, how to identify plants, how to figure this all out. I'm not necessarily a paranoid person that I'm, but it's just nice to have it in my back pocket. <laughs> Um, one quick note on collecting. I just want to uh, quickly mention um, that when you collect, if you collect, if you go out and forage, please look up the ethics of this. Um, acorns, whatever, take them all. But, you know, these other plants and stuff, um, you don't want to like take the entire lot. You want to leave enough for the environment to be able to replenish itself with those seeds. Um, so look up ethics of collecting and, and also make sure you're identifying the correct things. If you wind up eating something and poisoning yourself, you'll end up, you know, uh, in a book. Okay. So uh, I just want to uh, give you my contact information. So go ahead and take a screenshot of this. If you want, you can email, you can also find me on the Arkansas Archaeological Survey's website. That's fine. Uh, but there are a couple of resources that I want to share with you that I learned from heavily. Hank Shaw is a uh, California guy who uh, is a hunter, angler, chef, and he writes a blog on, on how he does things. And that's how I learned how to do the egg corns. That's how I learned how to do walnuts, um, a couple other things. So look at him. He's funny. He has a uh, one of his first cookbooks is called Buck Buck Moose. It's very funny. I like funny people. So anyway, Hank Shaw and then Sean Sherman, who is a, a Oglala Lakota uh, tribal member from South Dakota, who has um, coined himself the sous chef. Um, he is into um, uh, indigenous food ways, food sovereignty. Uh, he's got a new restaurant in Minnesota that I'm dying to go to. Uh, he travels around the country teaching other uh, tribes about, you know, learning their traditional food ways. He's a really cool guy. Dr. Ian Thompson is closer to home. He's um, the tribal historic preservation officer for the Choctaw tribe. Um, they're in Durant, Oklahoma. Fantastic man who runs his own farmstead with his wife called Nanawaya Homestead um, and, and also writes a blog about uh, their trials and tribulations of all different kinds of land stewardship and experimental archeology. span And then um, he's also written a fantastic book called Choctaw Food. Um, so look him up. And then even closer to home are our two big um, plant groups, the Arkansas Nat uh, Natural Heritage Commission and the Native Plant Society. Both have uh, social media websites, talks, meetings that uh, really promote, of course, native plants, uh, plant and, and land stewardship as well. And then, um, you know, if you want to go out and be a volunteer, join a master gardener group. Each each master, each county has a master gardener group, and then uh, each region of Arkansas has a master naturalist group. So, ways to learn about plants. Um, there's lots of them, and um, I really appreciate you uh, uh, spending some time during your lunch breaks today to learn a little bit more. Um, I hope I didn't uh, uh, leave out too many. I mean, I left out a million plants, but those are my five top favorites and uh, the reasons why they are my favorites. Oh, wait, one more thing. Archaeologically, acorns. We find the burnt acorn shells. I forgot. I always wanted to make sure that I tell you how we find these things in the archaeology, and that's a lot of bird nutshells. Um, and, you know, paleoethnobotanists can tell the difference between an acorn shell and a, well, hickory, I guess that would make sense. But anyway, they're amazing people. Um, I, if I could go back, I would be one of them. So, all right, I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to, uh, again, you know, if you need to, for whatever reason, uh, uh, find those, you know, just email me for, for some of that stuff, uh, some of those uh, 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 resources. Uh, but I'm going to um, just take a look at the chat and then uh, feel free to put, put questions in. Um, uh, 
so I'm sorry for those folks that might have had a couple of problems with um, with the viewing, but I hope you got back on track. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for for um, dealing with that part of it. Uh, show the link. Uh, uh, the link, I'm assuming the link that you were asking about April was the uh, gardening gathering agriculture link and that just look up Arkansas archaeology survey gardening gathering agriculture and you'll find it very easily and it's actually the the curriculum comes as a PDF you can download the whole thing and share it. Uh, so it's a free resource. Um, yes, unripe persimmon PTSD. Um, oh, uh, something I was going to mention. Not that you need to go scrounging around, but there is a really beautiful burrow tree at the Shiloh Museum. Um, don't go collecting. I know Marty likes to keep a lot of those and use them for himself, uh, but you know, just take a look at that burrow tree. It's fantastic. Um, uh, pawpaw jam, yes. Anything with pawpaws, but it's hard. Yeah, like you, like you said, Doc. When when she can get them, they are not. And once you find people keep their pawpaw groves secret, I have found a couple, and I'm not telling you where I found them because every year I go there and I just stand there and stare at these things. And you can shake the tree and if they come off, sometimes they're ripe and sometimes they're not. And it's really depressing. Um, and uh, processing flax into linen is probably that redding process. Lenita, uh, Lenita, I'm glad to see you here. Um, uh, you know, yeah, pro processing uh, flax into linen is probably uh, probably similar to the pawpaw fibers. Um, have pawpaw for the swallowtail butterflies, absolutely. Um, lots of different pollinators and actually flies pollinate pawpaw. Pawpaw have black, weird flowers that kind of hang down, supposedly smell like rotting flesh. So a lot of flies um, like to pollinate uh, pawpaw. And actually uh, sometimes people will hang rotting meat in, the, in their trees, in the pawpaw trees to attract flies so that it does help with the pollination. Man, because those pawpaws, they are just need, they're snowflakes, man. They just need to be spoon fed all the time. Um, Oh yes, that's good, Sarah Gertz. Uh, flowers and berries of the elderberry also look like devil's walking stick. I think the difference would be is that devil's walking stick, as far as I can remember, has like little spikes on the stalks and the elderberry um, has a smooth stalk. And by the way, you can propagate elderberry um, by cutting the stalk and then sticking it in soil. I've done it at my house, um, sticking it in soil, letting it root and then giving it a couple of years, but then eventually it takes off. Um, so that's good. Um, uh, the name of the pawpaw book is, it's a good book. I haven't, I need to go, I need to get on, get on it again, but it's just, sometimes it's hard to do nonfiction when I have graduated and never want to read nonfiction again. It's called Pawpaw in search of America's forgotten fruit by Andrew Moore. And by the way, Guy Ames propagates pawpaws and sells them uh, at the at his at his nursery, and he's my personal hero for doing it because I am failing miserably. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks. I love you, thank you, thank you. I didn't. They didn't say I love you. I'm just saying I love people that are thanking me. Thank you. Passion fruit, uh, may pop. Lenita, passion fruit is yeah. It's a it's a native fruit. Um, it's called the May Pop, or uh, um, uh, my brain has lost me for the for the Latin name. But anyway, May Pops are really cool. I've not done anything with them because I just eat them when they're when they're ready. But like, I think that they would make the most incredible juice. I just never have enough of them to make a cup of juice. Um, but they are found in the archaeology. Uh, pretty big stand up Falcon Cat. Thanks. I'll, I'll come down and visit. <laughs> um, and they were used in the in, in by pre-contact um, indigenous folks because we we have the seeds. Oh, thanks, um, JC, to for putting the link because I was too lazy to go type it in. So uh, the gardening ga gathering agriculture link is right there. All right, it looks like nobody wants to actually um, talk. So feel free to if you have any other questions, um, contact me or type any final questions in the chat. Um, again, I hope I didn't disappoint. Sorry, I led you on thinking you were gonna learn about corn. Maybe I'll come and give another talk about corn one day. I had lots of fun with corn. Um, okay, I guess, uh, Rachel, do you wanna- I have a question. Oh yeah, oh, Gerald. Go ahead. 
Oh, uh, I was going to ask you about the uh, the dog bane. What what's the fiber used in that? That's really a strong little fiber. Yeah, dog bane. Um, you know, we don't see it. I don't see it growing extremely like prolifically here in Arkansas anymore. I grow it on my front lawn. Uh, but the dog bane, um, I've watched a really great video on processing that fiber. Basically, if you break it, if you break once it's dry, the, the stalk has to be dry. And if you break um, the outside brown layering off, uh, right underneath of it will be the fiber. There's like a pith also, but you don't want the pith. It's like a fiber that comes right off the pith underneath the brown um, stuff on the outside, bark, you know, whatever you call it. Uh, and then that gets spliced together into very, yes, very strong um, stuff that they were they were also using. You know, I don't I don't feel like I, we have any artifacts here um, in in the university museum or in the surveys collection that. Surely we have dog bane something, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. But, you know, that was a huge, um, another huge cordage plant. Okay, thank you. Thank you.